In this video, I'm gonna share with you some tips and tricks that I've learned in 20 plus years of hanging out of helicopters or airplanes, taking photos from the sky. Let's dive in. This is the very first camera that I purchased specifically for aerial photography. I uh, bought it off eBay back towards the end of 2002, when I, um, right before I started my aerial photography company. And um, this thing was a workhorse for me for many years. If you're not familiar with this camera, it's a Pentax 6.7. Uh, it's medium format and it shoots 120 and 220 film. So that'd give you about 10, to tw 10 or 20 exposures uh, respectively. This on the bottom, this is a Kenlabs gyro and it essentially provided stabilization. Um, the two together weighs a ton. <laughs> so it was a good arm workout um, back in the day and uh, I was a bit younger, so I, I really appreciate the lighter um, tools that I have now. But you can see it has a, a cord, so I was always tethered to this battery pack and uh, I mean, people still use these gyros today. They're great, it's solid. This one still works and I'm gonna keep it just in case I need to do some aerials um, you know, with film again. But um, now my workflow is a bit easier, which I do appreciate. Um, so I've been shooting aerial photography for myself for, you know, commercially for, um, little over 20 years and before that I flew aerial photographers around quite a bit when I was working as a flight instructor and then um, prior to that in the mid 90s I worked for several aerial photography companies as an image analyst and a tech and uh, essentially what I would do back then was making maps. I'd create digital elevation models and I'd sit on a machine like this um, all night long, um, taking these large format uh, film positives and, um, and clicking away, creating uh, um, maps and models. So um, I've learned a lot along the way. Been in the industry for quite some time. So that's why I wanted to make this video and kind of share some of that knowledge with you guys. Um, now, enough about my background. Let's talk about the this video. So I broke this video up into three different parts. So part one is going to be uh, planning, which is the most important part when you're um, you, when you've got an aerial photography project to shoot. Uh, the planning phase, we're going to talk about the software I use to plan. Uh, we're going to I'm going to go through some examples with you. Um, we'll talk about the benefits of airplanes versus helicopters and how to find an aircraft to rent and a pilot. So that's planning. Um, the next one, the next part is packing. And this is an important piece as well because there's not a lot of room in the cockpit. So we're going to talk about bags, the type of bags that I use and I recommend, um, as well as what my my core aerial photography kit looks like. Okay, so that, that'll be packing. And then the last part is shooting. And we're gonna look at, you know, what to do on the day of your, you know, your mission and um, settings to use. Now, I'm gonna be talking a lot about the Z8 and the Z9. And at the end of the shooting section, we're gonna dive into the, my, my aerial photography bank that I have set up for my Z8 and my Z9. Now, even though this is specific to these two cameras, um, if you're shooting a different model, you'll probably have similar capabilities and there's still information that you can glean and hopefully it's useful information that you can glean uh, for your setup as well. Okay, this video is going to be a long one. I apologize. Um, so I want to I went ahead and put some chapter markers down below so that you can skip ahead to whatever section that you're interested in. So grab some coffee and let's start talking about planning.
Okay, so the first thing I do when I start my planning is I go straight to Google Earth. This is a free app, if you're not familiar. It's for both Mac and Windows. I'll put a link down in the description. Um, but it is a super handy tool for planning your aerial photography projects. Now the way I'm gonna approach this, I'm gonna just give a quick example of how I would kind of handle a, a more urban type aerial photography project and how I would handle a rural type project. Um, I'm not gonna go too in depth into the ins and outs of Google Earth because that, that takes an entire video on its own. If you are interested in that, just let me know down in the comments and um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll make a in-depth tutorial. I've used it for quite some time. If you look over here on the left side, you can see for Airborne, um, I've been using it since 2008, plotting my projects and, and planning photography projects. So um, super handy for commercial work. I use, also use it for my fine art work, for you know planning um, trips, projects, areas to shoot, things like that. All right, so let's start off with the urban project. So typically, probably 95% of my clients give me an address. So all I have to do is type that into the search bar up here. And I've got, for my example, I'm using 4200 Scotland, and you can see it pops up right there. So it's 4200 Scotland Street in Houston. And you can just hit search, and it's gonna take you, it's gonna fly you straight to that location. All right, so there's our apartment complex. So the first thing I'll do with a project in Google Earth is create a, a folder like this, okay? And then I'll highlight the folder and I'm gonna create a place mark, place mark by going Shift Command P on a Mac. I'll put the Windows equivalent up um, on the screen. Uh, and then you could, you could name it, you could change the icon to whatever you want. And also note, it gives you the latitude and longitude. As I'm moving this around, it's updating that, which we'll talk about in a second. All right, so once you do that, uh, you've, you've, you've named it, you've selected your icon, you can go ahead and hit OK. I've already made one, so I'm gonna hit Cancel. And I'm gonna turn on my little place mark here called Apartment Complex. So once I have the place mark, I'll go ahead and I'll kind of zoom out and I'm gonna go ahead and, cl and clear out this search and we can see our apartment complex right there. And I'm gonna start looking for landmarks that I can use when I'm navigating. Now, if you're not used to seeing the, the world from above, um, it can be a little disorienting, you know, when you're up flying, trying to figure out where your subject's located. So I recommend that you, you, you kind of look for, you know, kind of like bigger picture type landmarks, as well as um, we'll zoom in and we'll look at some other landmarks that are closer to our, to our subject. So for this example, you know, as we're flying, to Houston, we'll say we're coming up from the north here, I know that my subject is halfway, it looks like, between the city and these golf courses right here. And these are pretty large golf courses, okay? So those are some landmarks I'm looking for. Other landmarks to kind of figure out north and south boundaries, I can see that we've got a railroad line, we've got a major interstate to the north, and then we've got a river and another pretty large river to the south of it. And it's actually closer to the river to the south. So that's something I'm noting. Now, the other nice thing about Google Earth is you can print. So I might go ahead, if I'm not familiar with this area, I might go ahead and print this shot out so that, you know, and I'd probably use a better icon than this yellow one because it kind of blends in. But so I, I can kind of have the big picture of where this is located as I'm flying to it, right? Okay, so we've got our kind of like our macro landmarks figured out. Now let's get a little tighter. 
So obviously you can see some pretty amazing landmarks here. We've got a, a cloverleaf intersection to the east. We've got some ball fields, like two baseball diamonds and a football field to the west. And we've got another um, baseball diamond or softball diamond to the, to the south directly. So these are excellent landmarks for helping me identify this apartment, apartment complex. Other things I might look for, um, you can see up here, you know, using like big box stores or malls, something, you know, those are all going to be easily identifiable from the air. Okay, so I would, you know, I'd print the big picture. I would then go ahead and zoom in and I would make a print of maybe this view. And, you know, I use paper copies still, but if you're using an iPad, you could, you know, you could print, save as a PDF and open this up on an iPad as well. Um, but I have found with my workflow, paper works, works really well. Okay. All right. So the other thing that you'll want to do besides print is copy the latitude and longitude. And you probably noticed when I was creating that landmark before that um, when I was creating it, we had lat and long and I could move it around. Um, the way you access that screen again is you right click on your, on your um, place mark and then you select get info and you can get your latitude and longitude right there. So my GPS takes decimal degrees, so that's why it's in decimal degrees. Um, but you might want to ask your pilot what coordinate format uh, their GPS accepts and then, you know, copy that down um, and bring it for your flight. And that way they can plug it in. And that's one less thing to stress about because the airplane will navigate straight to that waypoint. All right. So, and by the way, I'll show you really quick. Um, how to change that. If you go to the Google, this is in a Mac. Um, I'm not sure. I think it's under file in a, with a PC, but in a Mac, you go up to the Google, to the menu, you select Google earth pro, you go down to preferences and then right here it, you can change it from decimal degrees to degrees, minutes, or seconds. All right. We've got a couple maps showing landmarks um, around our subject. We've got the GPS coordinates in either decimal degrees or degrees, minutes, and seconds to give to our pilot so that we navigating will be a piece of cake. The next thing we can work on is our shot list. And, um, you know, our client was wanting cardinal directions, you know, all cardinal directions, all four, or all eight, whatever they wanted. That's a piece of cake. But they also wanted a the banger shot with the apartment complex in the foreground and then downtown Houston in the background. Well, Google Earth allows you to visualize your different viewpoints around your apartment complex. And so what we can do, if you look up here in the upper right corner, we can actually grab this end for north and we can rotate that around. And I know that Houston is to the southeast of this apartment complex. So I know I need to be in the northwest to shoot that. So I've got it right there. Now the, these arrows can change your angle of view. So if I tilt up, I'm going to be tilting at an angle towards the earth. And we can see downtown Houston there. And you can just pan and zoom to kind of change your height. And then let me tilt up again. Okay. All right, great. So, you know, we've got a pretty good um, set of leading lines here taking you to the city. We've got the apartment complex. All that's great. But I can't really see the shot. What Google Earth provides you with, and this is amazing when they added this, are 3D buildings of the... of the city. So now I get an amazing visualization of what this shot is going to look like 
It can help me with my lens choice. It can help me with, you know, where I think the airplane needs to be to get the angle, right? If I want these leading lines leading me to the city, you know, then I probably need to swing around. Oh, didn't want to do that. Maybe more like that. Zoom in a little bit. You know, so you can see how you can change your angle of view. Some things that I look for is, um, you know, I look for landmarks to tell my, that I'm going to tell my pilot to fly over. Okay, so for example, this large apartment building right here, that might be with a, you know, a medium to a long telephoto lens, that might be the perfect spot to have him fly over so that I can get this shot and I can get it a little tighter and compress the city, you know, compress the background a little bit so it looks like the apartment complex is, is, is much closer. Okay, so excellent for figuring out your shot list. Um, you can also print this off too, you know, so if this was your, if this was your composition that you were going for, you print that out, have that as well as the landmark maps that you made. Um, earlier and have that with you in the aircraft so that you can it'll help you on the day of the of the project okay so before we move on to the rural um, example let's just talk about airspace and obstacles because that's something that your pilot is going to have to deal with of course and um, it's a it, it's it would be amazing if you could show up with these printed for your pilot so that they kind of have an idea of what the airspace looks like around your site, your site as well as the obstacles um, in the vicinity. That'll help them know what altitude that they need to fly at um, and some other things. So um, this is a little more complex. Uh, I'll put a link in the description to a PDF on how to um, do this step by step. But essentially what you'll need to do is you'll need to go to this website right here um, at the FA's, uh, FA.gov's website. And they provide sectional charts and terminal area charts uh, that pilots use, basically they're maps of airspace and obstacles and all this good stuff that pilots need to know about. Um, and they, they, you can download these for free and you can import them into Google Earth, okay? And so I'm not gonna go through how to do that right now. I've already downloaded one for Houston. And just real quick, I'll just tell you the difference. A sectional chart you're, is small detail. A terminal area chart is, is greater detail. And you're only gonna have terminal area charts where you have busy airspace like we do here in Houston, okay? So I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so that we can kind of see. We've got an airport down here, actually right there, and then we've got another airport up here to the north. These are really busy airports. Um, and you'll see that once I turn on this terminal area chart. Okay, so what we're looking at here is the terminal area chart for Houston, Texas. Um, we've got two really busy airports, Intercontinental and Hobby, and you can see each airport is surrounded by or is enclosed inside a blue line. If we zoom in a little closer, we can see that the airspace within for this airport, for this particular area, extends from the surface all the way up to 10,000 feet. We cannot go inside of this area right here without special permission, and your pilot will know all about that. Same, same thing up here. You can see this blue line surrounding this busy airport, and you can see that its altitude goes from the surface up to 10,000 feet. Basically, you just add two zeros to the end of that to get the 10,000. Now, luckily, our apartment complex is not within this airspace right here, but it is in this other airspace. And to find out where that airspace extends is 
you need to look at these numbers right here. So it, it extends from 2,000 up to 10,000. So I know my pilot won't be able to go above 2,000 feet without special permission from air traffic control. And they may or may not allow us to go into their airspace. In, in our case with this apartment complex, it doesn't require anything like that. We can operate below 2,000 feet for the shots that we're getting, no problem. But just so that you're aware that the pilot that you're flying with has airspace issues on his or her mind. And if you showed up with a map on the day of your flight that looked like this and, you're, and you briefed them and you're like, hey, this is our subject right here. Um, you know, this, I, I have no idea what this, this map means, but I know you do. <laughs> and here are the obstacles. They would appreciate this immensely and it will actually increase the safety of your flight by being able to brief your pilot and show them these things prior to just getting into the airplane. I used to flight instruct and I would have photographers jump in, in on my schedule without talking to me or anything and I would finish up with a student and they would arrive and I, I would have no clue as to where we're going. Um, and before GP, before the technology that we have today, you know, I would then have to spend time to kind of research where on the sectional chart or terminal area chart it was located and uh, figure out, you know, um, if we're going to need special permission and things like that. So uh, I highly recommend that you, you print these out, you brief your pilot on the plan um, before you just jump in the airplane and go. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead next out of this. Um, the other thing that this shows you are obstacles. And these obstacles over here, so basically the upside down triangles with the dots, those are towers or buildings. Um, these are really tall buildings and, uh, or towers. I can show you an example of some towers. So here's some towers. They're at 2,049 feet MSL, and they are 1,972 feet tall. So that's how tall, if you were to measure from the ground all the way to the tip, they're 1,972 feet. If you're worried about hitting them in an airplane, you're more concerned with this number because we our altimeter that we fly altitudes on is based off of mean sea level. Uh, and so um, I would know that I would need to fly at least 2,600 feet above these to give proper clearance if I was flying directly over them. Over here, we've got downtown and so the tallest building is 1,011 feet over here or 1,001 feet. Um, the MSL altitude is 1,049 um, but that's a good amount about a mile and a half to two miles away from us so that those buildings shouldn't be a factor um, but these towers are definitely a factor especially if you're in a helicopter. If I'm in an airplane, I'm going to be well above that those um, altitudes, so that's not going to be a problem. Um, but if I'm in a helicopter, then I just, you know, it's a good idea to, to know where those are. Now the technology is amazing. You, you have them on your map, and of course you're looking for them as you're flying. But this is a great briefing tool. Okay. So that is that, and like I said, I recommend printing out a map like this and bringing it to your um, pilot. Okay, so that's it for our little commercial project. Um, that's, you know, that's typically how, how I, I plan them. Um, but now let's kind of look at a more rural, uh, more of an artsy type project. So, you know, um, We'll say that we want to photograph Delicate Arch up in Arches National Park. Now, of course, national parks, you can't use a drone. So the only way you can take an aerial of it would be with um, via an airplane or a helicopter. So up in the search bar, you can type in, you could type in Arches National Park. You could type also type in Delicate Arch and hit search. 
and it will pinpoint that arch for you. All right, so there you go. You can see I already have a, a pin on it, um, a place mark on it, um, but there, there's the search for it. I'll go ahead and turn that off and turn my pin on. Okay, so I've got my pin located here on Delicate Arch. Again, I'd, I'd right click, go to Get Info, and um, grab the latitude and longitude. I would look for interesting landforms to kind of help me find the arch. Um, you know, in this case, we've got we've got an arched road with a large parking lot, and then we've got this. You can probably see this Delicate Arch Trail going out to it. And then we've got a canyon coming through here that kind of wraps around and goes to the north. So all of those are uh, landmarks that would be easily identifiable from the air. Of course, your GPS is going to take you straight, straight to the arch. Um, now, airspace is another thing that we need to think about. Um, and a lot of people kind of assume that, you know, out here in the West, there's no busy airports around here. You can just do whatever you want, but that's, that's not the case. Um, Delicate Arch, this area falls under um, the Denver sectional chart, and that's what I downloaded here. And if I zoom out a little bit, and by the way, these sectional charts are also great for finding airports near your, your subject. So in this case, we've got Canyonlands Regional, where that's, you know, I could Google that airport, try to find a, a flight school or a tour operator, um, and, you know, reserve a plane or a helicopter with them for this mission. Um, but over here, we can see Delicate Arch and its location, and it doesn't have the same type of airspace that we looked at earlier, but it does have this blue line with the dots surrounding it. And the dots indicate the direction where the protected airspace is. So it's always going to be on the inside within the airspace. Um, so you can see here that um, basically this is all of Arches National Park and this is a conservation, this is conservation airspace. So pilots need to stay at least 2,000 above 2,000 feet above the ground over this airspace so as not to, you know, create excessive noise or disturb animals and so forth. So um, the sectional chart gives you some elevation points. One is up here to the north of the park and it's 5,600 feet. And then we've got another um, elevation point down here which is the highest point within the park, which is 5653. So I just round that up to 57. So I need to fly at least 2,000 feet above that elevation. So that would put me right at 7,700 feet uh, MSL. So that's something that you could tell your pilot. Again, I would probably print out these layers and that way your, your pilot has a, a good indication of where they're going, you know, in the, in the pre-brief. All right, so that's, um, that's how I plan my urban and more rural or fine art type aerial photography projects. Um, the planning phase, the more time you spend planning the more successful your project's going to turn out. So the next thing you need to think about is if your project requires an airplane or a helicopter. More often than not, you can get the shot with an airplane. However, helicopters do allow you to get lower to the ground. They allow you to fly slower and to hover. So there are definitely a lot of benefits to running a helicopter. One drawback of a helicopter is that they're about five to 10 times more expensive per hour than running an airplane. So back when I was running helicopters a lot here in, the, in Texas, um, I was paying between, or my clients were paying between 600 and $1,300 an hour depending on if it was a two-seat helicopter or a four-seat helicopter. 
Um, as far, far as the models of helicopters out there that you can rent, every region is a little different, but for my experience, the Robinson helicopters, a lot of the flight schools have those, a lot of the tour operators uh, operate those. So the R-22, which is a two-seater, uh, and the R-44, which is a four-seater, those are pretty popular helicopters. Other manufacturers like Bell, they, they make amazing helicopters. If you're flying in a Bell, you're probably paying well over um, $1,000 an hour. And, um, you know, and that might be what the project requires, and it just kind of depends on the finances of the project. Um, so if I had my choice, I would, I would, without a doubt, pick a helicopter over an airplane just because of the maneuverability um, that it provides you. Plus the view is absolutely amazing. Uh, but airplanes are great, and for the most part, you can get the shot with an airplane. It may take a few more orbits. And the airplanes that you're going to want to fly in are high-wing airplanes, like a Cessna 150, that's at the lower end. Uh, a Cessna 172, that's the one I, I fly most often. Um, a Cessna 177 is probably the best aerial photography platform out there. It doesn't have a wing strut, and, and if you get the RG version, it has retractable gear. But all of those airplanes, what they have in common are high wings. So basically the pilot, if this is the wing, the pilot sits and the photographer sits below the wing. So that you know when you're photographing and the aircraft is banking, the wing is out of the way. If you're in a low wing where the pilot sits on top of the wing, then you know when you're banking, your wing is in, is in the way of your shot. The next thing you th need to think after you figure out, well, do I want to shoot it out of an airplane or a helicopter? Is where am I going to find this? And um, you know, I would recommend going to a flight school. Um, you know, like I said, you could you can pull up a sectional chart and you can see the the um, names of airports that are close to your subject. And then just type that into Google along with um, flight school or tour operator um, and, and see what comes back. And um, I would re rec recommend going to that tour operator or flight school um, you know, before the day of your project. Try to meet the pilot if you have the maps like we talked about, you know, if you can, if you can brief them and kind of give them a heads up of what, you know, your project is all about, um, that would be ideal. But um, flight schools are, are, are great resources. There's a lot of pilots out there eager to fly photographers around, tour operators as well. I would try to find, you know, the most experienced pilot that you can find and, and ideally one that has experience flying aerial photographers. Hey guys, sorry to jump in. I uh, forgot one very important piece when you're calling these flight schools and tour operators. You want to make sure that they have some way where you don't have to shoot through the window of the aircraft. So on helicopters, typically, that's removing the door um, of the helicopter where you're sitting. In airplanes, it typically is removing the hinge on the window and then in flight, you basically open the window and the, the window will swing up against the wing out of your way. Um, most aircraft windows are scratched. They're pretty hazy and they'll really degrade the image quality um, of, your, of your photos. So you want to try to avoid it at all costs. Now, some, some um, aircraft have photo windows installed and those are higher quality windows that you're shooting through and typically they'll they'll turn out all right but um, still the best thing is is not to have anything between your lens and the air outside the aircraft if at all possible all right let's get back in the video so. all right that's it on planning um it's probably the longest section of this video because it's the most important so next is let's start packing
All right, well, welcome to my garage workshop. Apologize for the terrible lighting and the echo, uh, but this provided a little more space than my office does. So um, packing, we're gonna get to packing in a second. I wanted to just kind of add a couple things to planning that I forgot to talk about. Number one is um, weather. Uh, find out what your, the cancellation policy is at the flight school or tour operator and you know, start checking the weather a few days in advance of your shoot and be sure to cancel if it looks like it's going to be too cloudy um, to get the shots that you need. For example, a few months ago I had a shot um, for a client that I need to shoot at 6,000 feet and for a few weeks, the clouds were, you know, 3,000, 4,000. I, I, you know, I can't shoot through the clouds. So I was, ha keep, I was having to keep pushing that project um, further and further out. So um, pay attention to that. Know what the cancellation policy is. That's, that's a really important so you don't get um, any extra cost uh, associated with the project. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you um, are my maps. So this is the clipboard that I take in the plane with me. Um, you know, I've got my overview map right there of all the projects that I shoot. And then I'll, for each project, I'll have an overview page and then I'll have, um, you know, a, a closer in um, shot of, to kind of show some landmarks and things like that. Just like we talked about. So I do practice what I preach, <laughs> um, and I've been using this technique for, uh, you know, a, forever, <laughs> basically since I started. So I probably stole it from some other guy, I don't know. But, um, okay, so I think those were the two things I wanted to cover. Now let's start talking about packing. Um, cockpits are really small, and so there's not a lot of space in there. If you're flying in a high wing airplane, then you're most, more than likely, you're gonna be sitting in the front seat, uh, you know, with the window open, and there's not gonna be a lot of room around you except um, on the floor to put your bag. Uh, there is, in most small light aircraft, most of them have a back seat, but turning around to access that when you've got your harness and everything else and your headset on, um, you know, it's kind of difficult to do. So you would want a, a smaller bag. Now, if I'm, if I'm flying in a, heli a larger helicopter, you know, a four seater, then I'm going to be sitting in the back seat with the door off. And, you know, typically I always shoot by myself. So I'll have a um, seat next to me and also the floor to put a larger bag. So in those cases, you can, you can bring a larger bag, but you know, you want to check with your operator to, you know, see how much space that you're going to have. The other thing I highly recommend is especially, and this really only applies to shooting out of a helicopter with the doors off, and that's a tether strap, some type of tether to secure to your bag. So, you know, you would tie it to your bag and then you would attach it to the helicopter and ask your pilot where um, he or she would want it attached. But that way, if you accidentally kicked your bag or if you hit some turbulence or the, air, the helicopter banked, uh, your bag doesn't go flying, you know, out, out the door, which would be a problem. Um, you really don't have to worry about that in an airplane because typically you're just opening up the window and the bag is down at your feet or right next to you and um, it, it won't go anywhere. Okay, so the bags, we're going to talk about three different bags. Um, this is my smallest bag and it has my entire aerial photography kit. Uh, and this is like my backbone kit. This is it. It includes two bodies. I have my main body. I have a backup body, which also, if, if I'm needing to shoot different focal lengths, I can throw a lens on and I can have both bodies, you know, ready to go. I try not to change lenses when I'm flying because, um, dust can get inside. And, um, matter of fact, my D8, uh, my D800, and I, I think it was a D810, 
uh, when I sent, off, sent it off to this professional to get the sensors clean, because I could not get them clean, he, uh, when he sent them back to me, you know, he gave me a little bit of a discount because he couldn't get them really clean, and he felt bad. But he said they were the dirtiest sensors he had ever seen, and that was because those two bodies were constantly, I was constantly changing lenses, and there's a lot of airflow in the cockpit, and there's tons of dust in there, and they were, they were just getting coated. So even though the Z9 and the Z8, which are the two bodies I shoot with now, they have those sensor shields, I still try not to, to swap lenses if I, if I don't have to. Um, okay, so like I said, two bodies, um, one main body, one backup. Uh, the backup is not only for throwing a lens on, but also if your main body uh, you know, malfunctions. Um, and I did have my D810 malfunction one time, and it, it ended up being okay, but I didn't have time while I was flying to try to troubleshoot it, so I just swapped bodies and I kept shooting. And you know, that's, that's why you want a backup, because Murphy's Law, something will happen, and you want to be prepared for that. Okay, so two bodies. I have two lenses, which we'll look at. Um, I have extra batteries. I have memory cards, extra memory cards, um, a neck strap, and filters. And that is it. And they all fit in this nice little bag. Now, this bag is a Mountain Smith Tour FX. And I think I bought it back in, I think I bought it in 2014. And it is well made. I have another Mountain Smith bag called the Tour, which is smaller and is really designed for back, for hiking. Um, and I've had it for I think over 25, maybe 30 years, and I'm I'm still using it. I love that bag. But um, this is a great bag. I'll put a link down in the description. Um, they don't make this exact model anymore, I don't think, but they have one that's similar, and I'll, I'll put a link down down below. Um, it'll actually be a link to my gear page where I have some other things as well that you might want to check out. Now those links are affiliate links. You don't pay any extra, but it does help support the channel and I appreciate that. Okay, so let's look at this bag and what I pack in it. So on the outside, I have all my batteries. So my Z8 batteries, let me get my coffee out of the way. Got my Z8 batteries. I bring two of those with me, and a Z9 battery. Um, and we'll talk about the Z8 here in a second. Um, but I make sure that these are fully charged before I throw it in my bag. Uh, and of course, in your camera body, make sure those um, batteries are fully charged as well. Now, I norm normally don't bring the filter holder but I do put filters on both my lenses. Um, this is a haze filter by Tiffin. Uh, in Houston, we have terrible haze, especially in the summertime. So this kind of helps cut through that. And um, on, you know, I'll either use a haze filter or a UV filter. You know, like I said, the cockpits are, are small and it's real easy to accidentally you know, bump your lens into you know, something in the aircraft and I would much rather break a, a filter than the front element of my lens. So I always, you know, when I'm shooting aerial photography, I always have some type of a filter on the front, so just for protection. And I think that's it. I think that's it in the, that pocket. This top pocket holds my memory cards. So you know, if you're, if you, you know, you have two bodies, make sure you have. Uh, memory cards for both bodies and that they're pre-formatted before you uh, do your shoot. Uh, it would be terrible to grab your backup memory card and it be full and now you have to decide you know what photos you're deleting essentially. So make sure those are pre-formatted um, prior to getting into the aircraft. I think that's all I have in there. And then on the outside pocket we've got a neck strap. So whether you use a neck strap or uh, a wrist strap, whatever you know, your flavor is, have some, something to secure the camera to your body because it's going to be hanging out out of the window or out the door. Sometimes I would stand on the skid of the helicopter. I was tethered. 
um, my body was tethered to the aircraft in, in those cases. But, um, you know, in case you dropped your camera, you want something to, to, to keep it with you. <laughs> that would be terrible. Okay, so that's, that's what I have on the outside of the bag. Now, all this stuff would fit on the inside of this bag as well, but especially if I'm shooting in a helicopter, I don't want to have to open up my bag if I, if I don't have to. And the reason is my bag's going to be tethered, but the contents inside isn't. So if I had my, my case open and we hit turbulence or I accidentally knocked it over, there's nothing preventing uh, the contents of your bag to just get you know, thrown out into space. So um, I, I tend to try to keep it all zipped up um, as, as uh, you know, if I can, and I have everything that I might need, change a battery, change a memory card, um, and th that's pretty much all you need on the outside pockets. Okay, so let's look at the kit. Uh, we'll pull out the Z8 first. This is the Z8, and the lens is the 24 to 120, and that lens pretty much just stays mounted on my Z8. Now, when the Z8 first came out, I was a bit concerned about the battery life with it. I made a video, I'll put a link up above, you can check that out. You can see how much smaller the Z8 batteries are compared to the Z9 batteries. Um, in that video that um, is up above, uh, you, you'll see that when I tested it out, I got well over, I think it was over 1200, I can't remember exactly, but it was like 1200 uh, images that particular um, day. I just recently flew, um, just earlier this week, another photography flight and it was pretty cold. It was like 26 degrees Fahrenheit in the cockpit. Um, and I got over 1800 images and used just half the battery. So battery life and the number of frames that you get out of a out of a battery is much better than I expected so that's why the Z8 has become my go-to for aerial photography I like the size of it I like the weight um, and it's essentially you know as you know just a baby Z9 okay uh, the 24 to 120 lens might as well talk about it since we have it out there um, that covers pretty much all the focal lengths that I use um, if I need to go a little bit tighter, you know, if I need to um, zoom in even more than 120 millimeters, uh, I have it set up on my, on my Nikon to press a function button and it'll flip me to DX mode. Um, you know, if, if I need full frame, if I need all the mega, megapixels then of my camera, I'll just throw this, this other lens on my, on my Z9. Okay, so that's the Z8, that's my primary, primary body. My Z9 is my backup, and so if my Z8 malfunctions, I've got the Z9 ready to go, and um, you know, or if, I'm, if I know I'm shooting two different focal lengths, this is my other lens, the 100 to 400, and it'll just go on the Z9. So the Z9 is my backup for aerial photography, but it's my primary for long lens photography. So sports photography and any wildlife photography that I, that I shoot. So I think that's it. That is everything. Another thing I like about this bag is it's real bright on the inside. I actually have a pad down there, but you can see it's real bright on the inside. And so it's really easy to see things. Um, in your bag, which is helpful when you're operating in a in a you know a cockpit and trying to find what you need to find. So, okay, so that is my smallest bag that I use. This next bag I use if I'm bringing like uh, video equipment or another body. Uh, sometimes I'll bring my my Leicas up with me. Um, so this is the Mindshift backlight. And it's an 18 liter bag. Uh, this is a great bag. I've been using it for um, several years now. Uh, this has some nice outside pockets as well to throw, you know, your batteries and what have you. Um, my workflow with this bag is pretty much everything is inside. I, I don't, you know, if I'm using this bag, it's probably in an airplane. 
and it's sitting next to me and there's no chance of it flying out, so I have no problem opening it up and leaving it next to me. But it's got a lot of uh, outside pockets. It's got this one where you can, you can put, a, I think, a 16-inch laptop, and then it's got a tablet, uh, space for your tablet, and then it's a pretty deep pocket, so you can put tons of other stuff, you know, hat and gloves or whatever you need. Um, I'll put a link, of course, like I said, I'll put a link uh, down in the description um, for this one as well. Uh, let's see, for these big bags like this, what I look for is a bag where the shoulder straps will fold behind it and lay nice and flat. Um, this also has a waist belt, and what I do is I'll just, you know, secure it behind it. I, I want to get all the straps out of my way um, when I'm flying. So I'll have it sitting next to me just like this. And then you unzip it. And what's really cool, a uh, really nice design of this bag is that it's got this cord and then you can, you can wrap it, the, the harness, the, the shoulder harness um, for the seatbelt usually has a support up above and you can just kind of wrap that around that support and it holds this flap up against the seat and you're able to access these, these um, compartments here. And I also use it just to kind of put my sunglasses and my glasses in there um, for quick access as well. So um, really, really handy design. If you don't need access to these pockets, you can just kind of flip that around and set it down and, and there you go. But you can see uh, you've got tons of room on the inside. Um, and again, I, I bring this if I'm bringing, you know, extra video equipment or, you know, my GoPros and stuff like that, or maybe a, another body besides all this stuff. So everything fits in there nicely. The Z9, um, you know, a large gripped body like this, it fits in there and it's pretty much level. So the, the depth of this bag is, is, is deep enough for a grip body. So that's, that's a good thing. Okay, so that's the Mindshift 18 liter. Um, let me show you something else. This has nothing to do with aerial photography, but it's a really cool design of this bag and um, has to do with this little cord that we talked about. So let's say you have, you're out shooting and you don't wanna, you know, it's all muddy down below and you don't want to, um, you know, get your bag dirty. You can take off the shoulder straps and you got your waist belt on and then you, you um, so it'll be like this. You rotate it around your torso and drop it down. You unzip it and then this cord goes around your neck and I can't do it because I'm, I'm holding this up, but you would basically just cinch this. You'd pull this out. It's got a little push button here and then it'll go against your, your torso like this and then you have full access to your gear and then you can just put this back in, zip it back up, rotate it around, put your harness or your shoulder straps back on and you're good to go. So this is a great, all, I mean, it's great for aerial photography, you know, as an aerial photography bag, but it's also great for landscape photography. So, mind shift 18 liter, awesome. Okay, so last but not least is the Tenba Backpack V2. Now, what I was looking for was a smaller bag to carry my core kit where, you know, I, you know I'm not carrying a lot of video equipment or, or um, extra bodies or anything like that. I've just got my kit. And also if I needed to bring some clothing or food, I also have room for that as well. And this bag fulfilled that. Um, I'll kind of give you a, a quick tour of it. It's got this front pocket, which is great. Um, you can hold a laptop. I usually, for aerial photography flights, I'll throw my um, iPad in here. It's got a really nice deep pocket where you could put um, wallet keys, batteries, memory cards, what have you. It's got two pockets on the outside, and so it's got this one that's Velcro, expandable. You know, you can throw water bottles or tripods in these um, for hiking, you know, if you're doing that. 
Um, and then this other pocket's kind of elastic. I don't know if you can see it. But what really drew me to this bag was the roll top up here. And so this has been really nice to have, especially on, like on my last flight where it was really cold. So I was able to bring some extra, you know, an extra jacket in there, um, my hat, gloves, um, you know, some snacks. I even carry, if you notice, it's kind of thin. It's a little bit thinner than the backlight bag that we looked at before. So the Z9 doesn't, you know, a gripped body doesn't fit in there very well. It will fit in there and you can zip it up, but it's kind of protruding. So, um, you know, you may not like that, but what you can do is throw the Z9, you know, your, your gripped body up here in the roll top and then put some clothes around it to protect it. And that's a, I do that from time to time and it works just fine. But this roll top's great, you know, so if you need the extra space, you've got it. And then when you don't, you just roll it down and then secure it with the strap. So I really like this design and it fits really nicely in the cockpit. Uh, the shoulder straps, they do exactly what I want them to. They just fold back nicely and, and lay flat. And then the waist belt, it does have a waist belt, but I, you can remove it, which is awesome. So I just take it off because I don't need it when I'm, when I'm shooting aerials. And then this just goes right there next to me. Unzip it. Now on this one, there's no, there are no pockets here. So I just tuck this up underneath and just, and there, and there you go. It lays nice and flat next to me. It would be nice if there were some pockets there, but you know, it's a, it's a smaller bag and it's, it's fulfilling its role. And then inside I've got plenty of room. I throw my 100 to 400 over here, my Z8 with the 24 to 120 and the Z9 goes here. And again, it kind of showed this to you. You can see it sticks out quite a bit, but it will zip around that, but you're kind of putting a lot of stress on the zipper. It would be better to use the middle section here, and that way um, it, it would zip a little bit better. But it works for me, and I really like this bag. I use it not only for aerial photography, but just as a, a daily carry you know, type bag. So that is it, that's it for packing. You know, just uh, like I said earlier, I think, <laughs> um, I think I said this, um, you know, check with your tour operator or flight school, make sure that you know how much space that you're gonna have in the cockpit and then uh, pick your bag wisely. Okay, so now that we're done packing, let's go shoot. All right, so the big day has finally arrived and you are, your aerial photography mission is a go. You've been checking the weather and everything looks great, so you head out to the airport. I've got my, uh, my small bag here with my, um, you know, everything that we talked about is inside. I've got my maps, I've got a tether. We'll say we're shooting in a helicopter today with the door off, so I'm gonna have this bag tethered to wherever the pilot tells me to tether it. I've got my, uh, main, uh, my main body with my main lens on there, so the Z8 with the 24 to 120, and I've got my neck strap attached and my filter on the front of the lens. So I am all set, ready to go. Batteries are charged, memory cards have been wiped, and my, my initial settings that we're going to talk about are already preset. So, uh, you know, I, I don't have to make a ton of modifications. I'm just, you know, basically ready to shoot and may need to adjust a little bit here and there. Okay, so you'll want to show up to the airport a little bit early, um, ideally to brief your, your pilot. Um, you're going to want to make sure that the window hinge in your aircraft is able to be removed. I know they, you've checked to make sure when you called them, but sometimes those screws get stripped and you wanna make sure that it can actually get um, removed and so that the window can open up. Um, if they're taken off the door of a helicopter, then you know obviously that's gonna to need to be done as well. Um, so when you do meet up with your, your pilot and you do the briefing, you know, you're gonna have your, your maps with you and you can, you know, if you printed out those sectional and terminal area chart um, charts, 
then uh, you can go over the airspace and obstacles. Give the pilot a kind of a good idea of what you're, you know, looking to shoot, the type of shots that you're going to shoot. You know, if you may not understand what altitudes you're going to have to be at and things like that, but if you kind of give them an example of, hey, you know, I'm wanting a shot of this apartment complex with the entire city in the background, you know, all the way out to, you know, this particular point, your pilot's going to know that, hey, I'm going to need to fly this at a much higher altitude, which means I might need airspace clearance and things like that. Um, so discuss those shots with your pilot so they have a good idea of what's going on. Um, the next thing to talk about is, is communication. Now you're going to be wearing a headset and you're going to have a boom mic where you'll be able to talk to your pilot um, directly. But, you know, especially in a helicopter or and even sometimes in an airplane, there's going to be wind noise that's going to be hitting your mic. And so your pilot may turn your mic off or may have you put it behind you so that you're not getting a ton of wind noise. So if you're like, I used to like stand on the skid of the helicopter while I'm shooting tons of wind noise and, and coming into your mic. So we would turn off the, the mic and then I would use hand signals to tell the pilot what I needed to do. So communication is a, a really important uh, piece of that. Um, the last thing I always end all my briefings with is safety. Um, and, you know, I tell the pilot that, you know, I may a ask you to do something that you think might be unsafe. And if you, if there's any doubt as to, you know, if it's unsafe or not, don't do it and tell me and we'll figure out a different way to get the shot. Um, I have a personal experience with something that happened to one of my pilots that um, I used to fly with a lot. He was a friend of mine. We had flown together for two years. Um, he was basically my go-to helicopter pilot. And uh, one day I showed up at the airport. We were supposed to do an early morning sunrise shot and uh, he was nowhere to be found. And this was a guy that, um, you know, uh, he was always there early, always had the helicopter out. He was a great guy with a family. It was such a loss. But um, the day, well, you know, I, I called his voicemail. Uh, I called his cell phone, went straight to voicemail. And then about 30 minutes later, I realized that um, I had remembered hearing about on the radio about a, a helicopter crash. And so I got on um, the Internet and found the, the newspaper's article about it and sure enough his name was in there um, and what had happened was he was in a low altitude hover with another photographer and they the NTSB report thinks that they had carburetor ice um, that you know ice that formed in the carburetor which which um, they experienced a loss of power because of that and with with helicopters you know, if you lose power in a helicopter, you either need to have airspeed or altitude, and they can do this thing called an auto rotate where they can safely kind of land the helicopter. But in this case, they were low altitude at a hover, so he didn't have the airspeed, he didn't have the altitude, and they hit the ground and they both died. So now in my personal briefs, when I'm talking to a helicopter pilot, I'm like, look, we're not going to do any low altitude hovers that is lower than what you safely need to auto rotate this helicopter. Um, and if we're in that situation, just tell me and we can, we can still get the shot. We can just maintain the airspeed you need and we may have to do a couple of orbits to, to actually get my shot, but no problem, no problem at all. So safety is really important. There, aviation is not without risk. Um, and the better you brief, the better you plan, the safer your, your mission will be. Okay, so we've briefed it up. Um, they've removed the hinge in the window. They've removed the door. Um, you know, tether your bag. Make sure you get that tethered. And now let's just talk about settings. How are we going to have the camera set up? So let's first talk about the exposure triangle. Uh, the exposure triangle, you know, is shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. I shoot in manual mode, 
and I set my shutter speed to at least one one thousandth of a second. Now, with with the in body stabilization and the and the vibration reduction and all the things that these cameras have, they can handle lower shutter speeds than one one thousandth of a second. But typically, if if I'm shooting um, above one one thousandth of a second, I know I've got the shot. If I'm shooting below it, I make sure that you know I double check. I play it back. I zoom into a hundred percent to make sure that I have a sharp image before I, I leave that area. Um, so so yeah. So shutter speed at least one one thousandth of a second, ideally. Um, but you can go below it. Just you need to you know you, you need to double check it. Um, when you're shooting, make sure you're not leaning against part of the helicopter or the airplane because that will transfer all the vibrations into your camera. So try to be, you know, use proper shooting style, but and try not to be touching the aircraft when you shoot. Uh, aperture, uh, you know, depth of field is not an issue because we're so far away from our subject. Um, but you do want to shoot at a sharp aperture. Uh, you could shoot at f2, like if you had a 2.8 lens, you could shoot at f2.8 and things will be sharp. Um, but, you know, you want the sharpest possible image you can get and most lenses aren't sharp wide open. So you typically need to stop down one, two, maybe three stops below um, wide open to get that sharpest aperture. So for an f2.8 lens, I'll stop down to maybe f4, f5.6. With an f4 lens like this, I find f5.6 is pretty good. Um, it's really, this, the 24 to 120 is a super sharp lens. Okay, so that's aperture. And then ISO, I leave in auto ISO and I allow it to float as necessary. Um, I'll use exposure compensation to adjust exposure in tricky situations. Um, but you know, pretty much I just, uh, I leave it in auto, auto ISO and go from there. Um, the type of file raw, I mean, that's without question. Yeah. Shooting raw. Um, if you want to do raw plus JPEG, that's great, but, um, you're paying a lot of money, um, for these images, uh, shoot in the best file format that you can. Let's see, what else do we need to talk about? Oh, the release mode or the frames per second, right? That you're shooting at. I typically uh, shoot in continuous low uh, and uh, depends on what I'm shooting, but usually do bursts of eight to 10 frames per second. Um, and that way I have a couple of extra frames that are near identical in case like the first one I jerked the camera or, or it's not perfectly sharp. Um, as far as focus goes, uh, with the Z8, I've been using autofocus, but with prior cameras and lenses, um, on some of the lenses, they'll have a hard stop at infinity, and, it, and it's a true infinity hard stop. So I'll go ahead and set it to that, and then tape down the lens uh, with like gaffer's tape. Um, some of the newer lenses have the hard stop is beyond infinity and the manufacturers do this because of temperature variations that can affect where infinity actually is on your lens. So they allow you to actually go past infinity. So with a lens like that, I wouldn't tape it down. I just use autofocus. Um, or if you can find where infinity is, find it and then, and then tape it down. Um, but recently I've just been using autofocus and it's been working uh, great. I haven't had any issues at all. Okay, so we're shooting in manual. We've got our shutter speed plus um, at least one one thousandth of a second. Uh, we've got our aperture set to the sharpest aperture of our lens. We've got our ISO set to auto ISO. We've got exposure compensation ready to go to adjust the um, exposure as needed. I'm in continuous low, so my frames per second are eight or 10 or whatever you think you need. And um, in my case, I'm using autofocus or I've got my uh, lens in manual focus and I'm taped at infinity. And that's basically it. Now you just get to climb in the aircraft and uh, go have a blast, so. 
Now, this next, next segment is for you Nikon Z shooters. We're going to go back in my office and we're going to look at some Z8 and Z9 uh, settings in particular. So, let's go. Okay, so this next segment is primarily for Nikon Z8 and Z9 shooters, but it'll also, there are some things that will apply to other uh, camera manufacturers as well. So stick around um, for this segment. I'm going to give you some tips. I'm not going to go too in-depth into how to set up banks or, um, you know, different functions and uh, function buttons and things like that. I've made other videos for that. And so I will uh, pop them up up above um, as it applies to what I'm talking about. So be looking for those. I'll put also put a link down in the description. I do have playlists for the Nikon Z8 and the Z9, which has some of my, my setup videos in them, which, which can help you out if you're not familiar. These are pretty complex cameras. Seems like they're getting more complex as we go. So um, before we start looking at the back of the camera, though, I want to turn my attention to the computer. And if you if you watched some of my earlier setup videos, um, I mentioned a PDF, and I have a, a, a PDF of my settings for the Z9. Um, it's at revision one on my website, but I'm currently working on revision two. And I should have that out soon. Um, I'll put a post, um, I guess, in the YouTube community section. I'll send out a, a, a post uh, so that you, you guys know that it's available. I'm also working on a Z8, so that'd be like the first revision. Um, I, I've been just lazy and using my Z9 <laughs> blank form to kind of keep track of all my settings. But I, I finally have all the icons created for the Z8. Um, and so I'm going to um, have that available as well. All right. So this guide, there's a link down in the description. This, this setup document, um, there's, there's, a, there's a document for my specific settings. And then there will be a blank document as well. And like I said, revision one is on my website right now. So if you're interested in that, you can go check it out. And then revision two is going to be even better. Um, one thing that Nikon did since I last updated this for you guys is that they added the ability to customize more buttons. So more, you know, more buttons essentially became customizable that were um, that weren't before. So that's a, definitely a benefit. Um, the other thing in revision one, I don't think I have any of the lens buttons included on that. So they're included in revision two. Okay. So I just want to kind of go through this real quick with you. So you kind of have an idea since I'm pointing you in this direction. Um, and like I said, I'll put um, links to the videos that kind of describe how to set all this stuff up up above as we go through this. Um, so at the beginning of the PDF, you've got just basically how I've named my banks. Uh, you have your my uh, current my menu set up. And by the way, my my menu is not bank specific, so it doesn't matter what bank you have selected. Your my menu will will remain the same. Uh, moving on. Uh, we have iMenu set up. Now, iMenu is bank specific. So I have each of the banks and how I like to have my um, iMenu set up. And then we drop down into custom control shooting. Now, these are essentially mapping out all your function buttons on your camera. And like I said earlier, I've, I've added additional buttons. I've added lens buttons now. And the only ones, as we're looking at this right now, the only ones that are accurate to how my cameras are right now set up are the aerials. Everything else I'll probably gray out or just don't pay, don't pay attention to those because um, they're not accurate. I think they're the exact same ones as in Revision 1, actually. So um, if you download that, that's, that's what you'll see. But aerials has changed a little bit. Um, 
And we'll talk about that here shortly. Um, and moving on in this PDF, um, after you get through all the different, I mean, the, the Z9 has a ton of function buttons, as you can tell. So we're still going through all of them. And then you get to your lens buttons and, and rings. And then, and then that's it. So super customizable camera, which can actually, you know, distract you from what you're trying to do uh, when you're shooting. Uh, below that, I have my recall shooting functions hold setup. And if you don't know what that is, there's a video and you can check that out and how to set it up. But for aerials, Notice I have pretty much everything not selected and I only have my spot meter highlight weighted and we'll we'll look at that in a second. And then moving on along, you come to your custom controls playback. So this is very similar to, to the custom control shooting where you kind of map out all what you want your buttons to do when you're in playback mode. So we'll look at that as well. Okay, so let's have a look at my settings on the on my camera. Um, if I didn't mention this before, I'm we're we're looking at my Z9 because I've been shooting a lot with the Z8 and um, completely zapped all three batteries. So my Z9's batteries were uh, fully charged, so that's why we're recording on the Z9. Okay. Um, first thing you want to do is you want to make sure you're in the the bank that you want to modify. Uh, since I shoot a lot of aerials, I have my own dedicated bank, but if you don't shoot a lot of aerials, you probably just want to modify one of your other banks that you have set up. So first thing I'm going to do for quick access to banks, I've added it to my I menu. So let me make sure I'm recording on here. Okay, I am. Uh, I'm going to press the I button and you can see over here, I'm in uh, shooting bank A and custom settings bank A. So my aerial bank is D, so I need to change that. So I'll just hit OK and go over to aerials and select that. And then go over to my custom settings, select it, and then select aerials. So there we go. We're all set up. I've got both banks in my aerial banks. And now let's go have a look at the photo shooting menu and some of the settings that I change just for aerials. All right. Um, the first setting that I would highly recommend is the role played by card two uh, or card in slot two. And I set that to backup. Um, it would be horrible uh, <laughs> to do an entire flight and come back and have a corrupt uh, memory card. So I always have RAWs recorded to both memory cards so that if one does get corrupt and knock on wood that hasn't happened yet, um, at least I would have the backup in the other card. So I re highly recommend setting that to backup. Uh, image quality, we talked about that earlier in the settings video. You want that set to RAW, in my opinion. Raw recording, high efficiency, <clears throat> excuse me, high efficiency star is what I use. Uh, I haven't seen any difference between lossless compression and high efficiency star. And um, the high efficiency star is uh, quite a bit smaller. So I select that. Uh, ISO sensi sensitivity setting, um, I do use auto ISO. So I'll have it set to my base ISO with auto turned on and then the maximum sensitivity set to 3200. Now, I, I um, during the day with you know plenty of sunlight, uh, you shouldn't need anything more than probably four or 800 ISO. But if you're shooting in the evenings or early morning or maybe shooting a uh, sports field at night, you're gonna have to crank up that ISO and, um, and typically up to 3200 will work fine. Okay. So that's about it for that. Um, white balance really doesn't matter, but for consistency when I'm viewing it, when I'm going through it, I'll set it, you know, if it's sunny, I'll set it to daylight. If it's uh, cloudy, I'll set it to cloudy. Um, you can, of course, with raw format, you can always change that in post. And let's see what else. Uh, that 
is about it. Um, metering, I leave it on matrix metering, and then I have a function button that'll take me to spot metering, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But my default is sets of matrix metering. Uh, my focus mode is autofocus continuous, and I, I have my all my cameras set up to back button focus. Autofocus area mode, single point autofocus, um, auto subject detection, of course, is turned off, and then you're going to want vibration reduction turned on. Um, and that is about it for photo shooting menu. Now, let's go drop down to the custom settings menu. And for this menu, really the only thing I want to talk about are, are the control layouts, how I have my function buttons assigned. So let's go look at that. If we drop down to F controls, and then we go down to custom control shooting, you will see something that looks very similar to what we were looking at before on my little setup guide. And that's where I got all the images. Um, so, you know, that's where it's helpful to have a guide to write it down so that if you ever have to reset your camera, uh, you have it written down and you can just go through looking at it and set it up the way you want it. Uh, you know, Nikon does have a backup, a way you can back up all your settings. Um, but unfortunately, it backs it up to a card, and then when you reformat that card, it wipes it. So you have to have a pretty good workflow to, um, you know, basically reset your settings to where you wanted it, wipe the card, and then save it back to the card. I actually have a, a separate card that I use just to save my settings, um, but I wish Nikon would make a little bit better workflow for setting that up. Maybe in the next um, bodies will have some memory inside the camera where it'll actually save it inside the camera rather than having to save it to the memory card, which is kind of a pain. But, you know, it is the way it is, so that's what you kind of have to deal with, and that's really why I like to have a backup copy on paper. Um, as far as my function buttons go for aerial photography, um, I there's really only three or four that I, I, I use often, and the rest, I either leave them as the default or I turn them off so I don't accidentally mess something up. And so we'll go through a couple of these. I'm not going to go through all of them. You can look at my settings guide for exactly how I have things mapped out. But um, the first one I want to talk about is function button number one, and so that's right up here on the on the front of the camera, the, the top button up there. <clears throat> and uh, I have that set to recall shooting functions hold. So if I go in there and I have a look at it, you can see that um, most of these boxes are unchecked, but I do have metering checked so that when I press that button, it'll take me to spot metering highlight weighted. Um, if we hit the right side of the multi-selector, that's how you go in to ch change the metering. And you can see I have it selected there. So let me show you how this kind of works when you're shooting. So, you know, let's say um, I, you can see in the bottom left corner, I'm in matrix metering right now. And, you know, typically when I have to do this, I have a, um, you know, a, a, a tough ex subject, you know, it might be a, a really bright building that's reflecting, it's throwing off matrix metering or what have you. So I can just press uh, function button number one and you can see I automatically switch to spot metering highlight weighted. And I don't have to sit there and hold it, I can leave it in that, in that mode uh, until, you know, I, I need to change it. And then after that, I can just press it again and go back to matrix metering. I don't use this a lot, but there, I mean, actually I, I use it rarely. This button is almost getting remapped to something else, but I did have a, a project where um, I had to switch to that. And so I thought that might be a good purpose for that function button. Um, okay, so that's how that works. If we go back and the next function button is function button number two, and I have this set to choose image area. So that allows me, 
if I need a little more, um, you know, like a little bit longer lens, so my 120 millimeter is not quite cutting it, I can switch over to DX mode and, and zoom in a little bit more, essentially cropping in a little bit more. Um, and so I, you know, I can't always do that. It depends on what I'm shooting. And if they need full resolution of, from the sensor for whatever the final product is going to be, then I'm going to have to switch lenses or grab my Z9 with the other lens on. Um, but if, if I can crop in, then this is a really quick way to, to get a little bit longer reach. And so I have that set to function button number two. And so it kind of works like this. You're, you can see I'm in FX mode up there in the top right. And if I press function button number two and I rotate my rear command dial, it will automatically crop me in. You can see the DX warning up at the top flashing. So that's super um, handy at times. And then of course um, you can switch back by pressing function two and rotating the command dial. And it doesn't matter which command dial you use, you can use the front or the back. Okay, um, next function button. Well, one thing to note, function button number three I have turned off. And the reason why I have it turned off is because my Z8 doesn't have function three, and my Z9 is my backup for aerials, so if I did have to switch bodies and I accidentally hit function three instead of function two, I don't want it to do anything that I'm you know, not expecting. So I just have it off so it does nothing. And um, you know, for, for my other banks, for wildlife, for, um, you know, so for my fast action bank and for my landscape and handheld banks, I have function three assigned to do other things. But for aerials, I don't want, want it to do anything just because of the role this camera is now taking. Okay, so you can see that, you know, basically ISO is ISO, AF on, all my cameras are back but set up for back button focus. Um, so my AF on button is how I utilize autofocus. Um, and the next button I wanted to talk about was the video record button. Now, this I have set to control lock, and this is really handy. I, I was doing it with my D800 series cameras, and it's, it's really a nice feature. I'm not sure if any other manufacturer does this, but you're able to, con you're able to lock your shutter speed, you're able to lock your aperture, as well as your focus point um, by selecting a function button and rotating a dial. It's, it's really handy. So let me show you how this works. Well, first let me show you what, what, it, what it looks like when you, when you select it. So it's the control lock right there. And there's no other setting to it. You just select it, you assign it to a button. I have it assigned to this top button up here, the record button. And so the way it kind of works is, you know, right now you can see that I have that little L for my shutter speed and my aperture. And you probably noticed that box that popped up earlier when I, when I touched the screen where it says the focus point selection is locked. Okay, so I, ha I have my aperture, I have my shutter speed, and I have the focus point locked right now. So if I wanna unlock it, all I have to do is press the, the function button that it's assigned to, which is the record button for me, hold it and then rotate. If I wanna change my shutter speed, I'm gonna rotate the rear command dial to unlock it. Okay, so I'm doing something, I don't know if you guys can see, I'm tethered so I can't take this too far, but I'm pressing down on the record button right here and then I'm using the rear command, command dial to lock it and to unlock it. Now, if I want to, if I want to unlock my aperture, I press the function button, in this case the record key, uh, or record button, and then I use my front command dial to lock it and unlock it. Now for my control point, let's see if that's still, con yeah, it's still recording, good. Um, for my focus point, I press the record button and then I have to hit um, any of the, 
any side of the multi-selector. So I can go like that, and now my focus point is unlocked, and I can move it around. I rare, if, when I was shooting out of a helicopter a lot, you know, sometimes I would move that around. But primarily, uh, shooting out of an airplane, especially the way I'm doing it, flying and shooting, um, I just like that right in the middle. Um, there's really no need to move it around. Um, but if I, if, I, if I do move it around and I want to recenter it, then I have my OK button mapped to go snap right back to the center point. And then I can press the record button and I can press any side of the multi-selector and it'll lock it back. So really cool feature. Um, like I said, I've been using this since the D800 series. I'm not sure if it was available prior to that, but I didn't find it until like the D800. I think it was the D800 or the D850, but anyways. Um, okay, so that is that. That's pretty much, I think, everything with the custom control shooting that I want to talk about. What you will notice on this, in this bank, um, is that mo a lot of the buttons are just turned off. Like all the lens rings and lens buttons, I just want those off. I don't want to accidentally press one of those buttons while I'm shooting aerials and, and mess something up. So all those are turned off. Okay, let's look at Custom Controls Playback real quick. And there's only two buttons that I um, use and I don't use them very often but it's function 1 and function 2 and that's just different zoom levels so I have function 1 set to zoom 100% and then function 2 set to zoom 200% and I'll just show you real quick how to to change those settings so we'll go into our function button we go to zoom on and off, and then you can see that there's a little um, chevron or a little arrow on the right side. That means there's more settings over there that you can modify. So I'll hit the right side of the multi-selector, and then here you have all your different options that you can select. You can select low man magnification, 100% or 200%. And so that one was set to 200%. And so that's, you know, that's pretty straightforward. You take a pic you take a picture. If I can get this thing to focus. There we go. Take a picture and then just using the function button I can zoom into 100% or zoom into 200%. And that's pretty much it. Those are those are the settings I have. And so, you know, I I recommend keeping it simple as possible when you're dealing with aerial photography. Um, I remember taking photographers up <laughs> from time to time, um, and you know, especially when digital was first coming out and they'd be sitting there messing around with their camera a whole bunch. And I'm just sitting there orbiting around the site and, um, you know, it's, it's burning the clock, wasting time. And, um, you know, you don't want any distractions like that. So that's it. That's it for this segment. Hopefully you got something out of it. If uh, you have any questions, feel free to drop them down in the comments down below. And, um, you know, if you like this video, give it a like. If you want to see more videos, hit the subscribe button. You know, you know how YouTube works. So um, anyways, until next time, I'll see you later.